Hello, my name is John Dowling, and I would like to welcome you to this CPD uh, session on design for fire. I'm going to talk to you today about five different subjects. I'm going to talk to you about meeting regulations for fire, structural fire protection methods for steel construction. I'm going to talk to you about fire testing. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the specific issue of single story construction for fire. And I'll talk as well then at the end about fire engineering. Most fire precautions in buildings uh, relate to, to multi-story buildings. And big, but big fires in big multi-story buildings are actually relatively rare. This particular fire happened in 1991, and I make no apologies for using such an old slide. It's because I have not yet come across a better example in the intervening years. The building was in Basingstoke, and the fire started on the eighth floor, completely gutted the eighth floor, completely gutted the ninth floor, and very badly damaged the tenth floor before the fire brigade eventually brought it in under control. And so it was a four-hour fire, and if you'd gone into the building afterwards, you would have seen that. Despite the very large amount of damage you can see there, if you look at the top of the building, you'll see that the beams were fire protected using a spray protection system. And the columns down in the lower part of the slide, you will see were fire protected using a board protection system. That fire cost 20 million pounds of damage, but in fact, the structural fire repair was only a small fraction of that. In fact, in practice, there was no structural repair required. The building was fully reinstated and is now working again. What that tell that, that particular building was fire protected using the requirements that existed when it was constructed in 1986. It was fire protected for 90 minutes fire resistance. It survived a four hour burnout with no structural damage. In 1992, the fire precaution requirements were changed, not because of this fire, but for other reasons. But when in 1992, the fire precautions were changed, this building was then changed to, or the requirements of a building similar to this were then changed to 120 minutes fire resistance plus a sprinkler system. What that tells us is that certainly in our large and complex buildings such as this, there may be a lot of redundancy or conservatism in our fire precautions. And that issue is something we'll come on to later when we talk about fire engineering. If you look in the building regulations for information on fire resistance requirements, um, what you'll see there is a series of functional statements. In common with most advanced Western economies, the building regulations, the, the actual acts, the, the acts of parliament, which set, set out legal requirements, are couched in functional terms. They will tell you what to do, but not how to do it. And if you look at the requirement in the building regulation for structural stability, that's what you will find. The building should be designed and constructed such that in the event of a fire, it will maintain its stability for a reasonable period. The building regulations will not tell you what a reasonable period is. But what the gov governments of the various parts of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland do is they produce documents which give guidance on it. And the best known of these is approved document B, which applies to England. The Welsh, Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland systems are very similar to this. The approved document B, approved document B is part of the approved document series. And this tells you what approved documents are. Approved documents are not the regulations. They are guidance on how regulations and how the building regulations can be met. You do not have to use the approved documents, but they are used in the vast majority of buildings. If you want to look for structural fire resistance requirements in the approved document, you'll go to table A2 at the back of approved document B, and you will find a table. Now, this is a summary of that table. It's slightly more complicated in layout in actuality than you see here. But what you will see is that fire resistance requirements change according to the building height and the building occupancy. So they change at five meters, 18 meters, and 30 meters. And then they change according to the occupancy. Now, most non-residential 
buildings tend to be, most non-residential multi-story buildings tend to be offices, shops, commercial and assembly. Also, the vast majority of multi-story buildings are two, three and four stories. The tall buildings, buildings like Canary Wharf, the NatWest Towers, they tend to get a lot of attention. But in fact, in terms of representing the building stock, they're an anomaly. The vast majority of the multi-story buildings are two, three and four story. And the vast majority of them fit into that box there. And what it tells you is that in England and indeed throughout the United Kingdom, most buildings require 60 minutes fire resistance. 60 minutes is the dominant period of fire resistance. If you want to look at how building height is measured, it's not the absolute height of the building. Height is measured from ground level to the floor of the top story, the top of the floor of the top story. That is because height is all about access height for the fire brigades. So therefore, if you, if you remember in the previous slide, there was a, uh, you'll, you'll have seen that requirements change for buildings at five meters. Buildings under five meters using this definition of height are almost always two-story buildings. So anything under five meters is a special case of two-story buildings. Scotland has its own regulatory system and for fire, these are in interpreted through part two of the technical handbook. Fire resistance requirements are either short, which is 30 minutes, medium, which is 60 minutes, or long, which is 120 minutes. 90 minutes fire resistance doesn't really exist in Scotland. Buildings over 18 meters in height in, build in Scotland generally, not always, but generally require 120 minutes fire resistance. A height at which buildings elsewhere in the United Kingdom require 60 or 90 minutes fire resistance. You don't have to use the approved documents. You don't have to use um, the technical handbook too. You can go your own way. The provisions of approved document B have proven themselves over time, but it is, it is recognized that it may not always provide the optimum answer in all buildings. Our improved knowledge on fire behavior has made it clear that there is room for an approach which allows designers the opportunity to specify fire precautions according to the particular circumstances of the building. This led in 2008 to the publication of BS999, of which the British Standards Institute said, it promotes a more flexible approach to fire safety design through the use of structured risk-based design where engineers can take account of varying human factors. So BS999 has been written as an alternative to, approved document, to the approved documents in England and Wales. In Scotland, it appears that it would be looked on as an engineered solution, which would then be assessed in that way. And we'll come to engineering solutions later on. If you look at the features of 9999, it is based on an understanding of how risk is created in fire. And if you look at the risk factors in fire, there are four really big risk factors. It, there's the building height, whether the occupants are familiar with the building, whether the occupants are asleep, and the degree of mobility of the occupants. Of those, far and away, the two most important are whether the occupants are asleep and whether the occupants are familiar with the building. This is why, for example, fires in hotels are potentially so dangerous because those two factors come together. And it's why hotels, good hotels anyway, put a lot of training into the fire management and fire management training for their staff. 9999 also takes into account things like the likely fire load in the buildings, compartmentation size, whether there are sprinklers otherwise are, are, are uh, in the building as well. If you were to look at um, a comparison between approved document B and 9999, oh sorry, I should have said as well that double, uh, approved, sorry, BS9999 introduces a new height, cat new height category of buildings over 60 meters. That's because it is now widely recognized that there's a significant increase in risk as buildings get higher and higher, and we're seeing more and more of these very tall buildings. This slide shows the comparisons between structural fire resistance requirements for some common building occupancy. There's a lot of information here, but the overall lesson is that generally 
but not always, structural fire resistance requirements are lower in BS9999 than in the approved document. BS9999 has a much wider scope than just structural fire precautions, of course. And in general, it provides capacity for more cost-effective solutions. One word of caution, however, is that the recommendations of 9999 must be applied as an entire package. Favorable aspects of the guidance cannot be cherry-picked. I'm going to move on now to structural fire protection methods. And structural fire protection methods are is dominated in the United Kingdom by three different systems. There's thin film intramescent coatings, board protection systems, and spray protection systems. And I'll talk about each of these in turn. Thin film intramescent coatings are paint-like materials which react at high temperatures to form an insulative char around the steel. I have used the words thin film quite deliberately when describing the mater this material. That is because thick film instruments are also available. These thick film materials have been developed for offshore and petrochemical use, but in recent years, a number of manufacturers have modified their materials for use in buildings. However, it is a minority product, and it is thin film instruments and coatings which dominate the market. Thin film instruments and coatings can be decorative or non-decorative. Decorative coatings carry a significant cost premium and should only be specified where necessary. Over the last decade, thin film intramescent coatings have come to dominate the structural fire protection industry, in part at least because of the development of a successful off-site application industry. One quick point to note about this photograph is that it is a cellular beam. Because the failure mechanism of these beams differs from that of unperforated sections, a protocol exists for testing and assessment of thin film intramescents, which are used on them. Only coatings which have been tested to this protocol should be used on cellular beams. Fire protection applied off-site using thin film intramescent coatings is usually done in large sheds with good air movement after which it is allowed to dry before moving it to site. It's not the solution for every project, and it is a premium process. However, it has advantages such as clearing the critical path and taking a trade off site, making service insta installation easier, removing weather dependency, and so on. Where these factors align, it offers considerable value. The Association for Specialist Fire Protection, the ASFP, publishes a code of practice on off-site application. And if you're going to get involved in this or the specification or the application, I suggest you have a look at this. This is a technical guidance document from the ASFP. If you are going to get involved in fire protection in general, the ASFP uh, publishes a wide range of these technical guidance documents, and I commend them to you. They are available free from the uh, ASFP website. Boards offer the specifier a clean, boxed appearance and have, an, have the additional advantages that application is a dry trade. And this reduces the impacts that it tends to have on other activities. Also, boards are factory manufactured and thicknesses can be guaranteed. Furthermore, boards can be applied on unpainted steelwork. There are broadly two families of board protection, lightweight and heavyweight. Typically, lightweight boards are about 150 to 250 kilograms per meter cubed and are not, are not usually suitable for decorative finishes. They are typically used where aesthetics are not important and they're cheaper than heavyweight equivalents. Heavyweight boards are usually in the range 700, 700 to 950 kilograms per meter cubed and will generally accept decorative finishes, and therefore they're typically used where aesthetics are important. And you can see there an application where, where both are being used. And in this instance, you'd have a suspended ceiling coming in, coming in which would hide the uh, less aesthetic uh, non-decorative lightweight boards. Spray protection systems have the, advantages, have the advantages that can be used to cover complex shapes and details. And also that costs do not increase significantly with increases in protection thickness and fire resistance and fire resistance time. This is because much of the cost of application is in the labor and equipment and a minority is in the cost of the material. Some spray protection systems can also be used in external and hydrocarbon applications. 
Sprays are not suitable for aesthetic purposes. Also, application is a wet trade, and this may have an impact on other site operations. If specifying sprays, allowance may have to be made in costing for the possible requirement for for the possible requirements for prevention of overspray. So you have to watch that one. Flexible blanket systems are also in use. These are actually a real minority way, minority material. Uh, I don't see them that often, and it's a bit of a surprise to me. Light sprays that can cover complex shapes without the potential difficulties of overspray. They have a relatively small number of manufacturers. Um, as I say, it's a bit of a surprise to me that they're not used more often. We are fortunate in the United Kingdom in having a competitive and innovative structural fire protection sector. This has driven efficiency up and costs down to the point where the cost of fire protection is a fraction in real terms of what it was 20 or even 10 years ago. This is largely because of what has been termed the virtuous circle. One can jump into this circle at any point, but I will choose to start with more steel being used. This has encouraged more fire protection manufacturers into the market. That, that in turn has increased competition, which reduces prices, which makes steel construction more cost effective, and that leads to more steel being used, and so on. I mentioned the rise and rise of structural uh, of instruments and coating as the dominant form of structural fire protection. Uh, you can see it there in that slide. This comes from a survey which the steel industry does every couple of years. Um, and at the moment, between off-site and on-site application, inch mess and coatings are reckoned to have about 75% of the structural fire protection market in new buildings. This is very specifically in new buildings. There is a significant fire protection market in refurbishment. Um, and anecdotally, that appears to be dominated by boards. But this is specifically for new buildings. Um, this is actually the same information, but with the uh, on-site with the sorry, with the instrument and coating split to on-site and off-site application. The on-site is in green, the off-site is in red. You can see there that over the course of the recession, the off-site took a little bit of a hit. That's what you might expect because it is a premium process, but it is now recovering back up to its own levels. It's been at one stage as high as 30% of the total market. You don't have to use the proprietorial forms of fire protection, of course, you can do other things. Uh, concrete encasement is still occasionally used. I tend to find it in situations where resistance and knocking and damage and abrasion is important. And a typical example is shown here. This is an underground car park. You can use other forms of fire protection. You can use block infilled column, as you see there. This will give you an hour, sorry, it will give you 30 minutes fire resistance. Um, and again, it tends to be used in situations where you know, the fire protection might get a bit of rough treatment. Um, not terribly common, but it is used. If you're going to use other forms of fire protection, one of the most, best and most successful things you can do is actually build in the fire, the fire resistance or the fire protection into your form of construction. And one of the most successful examples of that, of that is Slim Deck. This uses an asymmetric steel beam where the bottom flange is wider than the top flange and a deep deck. Uh, you put the deep deck on the bottom flange and then pour the concrete in around the beam. That'll get you up to an hour's fire resistance, and that's been quite successful. There's other things which have been used as well. A lot less successful are shelf angle floor beams. I don't come across this very often, but you can get up to an hour's inherent fire resistance out of that. And you can also do things like uh, you can fill in between the flanges of the beam or the column with Reinforcing, reinforcing bar and then concrete. I don't see that used in this country at all, but it is occasionally used on the continent. Or you can use hollow sections, filled hollow sections. And filled hollow sections are actually starting to become a bit more common. And I'm starting to see more and more of them now. Uh, in particular, reinforced concrete filled hollow sections are really becoming quite common. Um, this has various advantages and the link there is Want, it's provided to an article where additional information can be found. So just go to steelconstruction.info and look for an article on hollow sections in fire. What you will find in there as well is a link to some software called Firesoft, which will help you and assist you in designing reinforced concrete filled hollow sections. As I say, I'm starting to see a lot more of that now. 
much of the preceding information has made reference to periods of fire resistance, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. What does that mean? Does it mean that after a fire in a building, does it mean that if you have a building with 60 minutes fire resistance and then there's a fire in that building which lasts for an hour, that building will collapse? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It has a very specific meaning. There are standards available governing fire testing. In the, in the United Kingdom, one, the one that which is most commonly used is BS 476. Those standards follow, or any test carried out to those standards will follow a designated time temperature curve. And you can see the curve there. <clears throat> that's, that's a very specific relationship in there. If we say that, for example, a beam has an hour's fire resistance, what that means is that if you took that beam, put it in a furnace, loaded it, and then cranked up the furnace to follow that time temperature curve, it would survive for an hour. However, that is an extremely severe fire. If you look at it, that temperature is going up all the time. That doesn't happen in practice, as we'll see in a few minutes. In practice, the only way that could happen is if somebody stood there next to the fire and started chucking paraffin or petrol on top of it. So the standard fire is actually a very, very severe fire. And the standard fire test is a very, very severe fire test. And that is why collapses in buildings in fire are so rare. It's because the fire test is so severe and therefore introduces a lot of conservatism. I'm going to change the subject now and I want to spend a little time talking about single story buildings. Generally speaking, fire precautions in the UK are set out in documents such as approved document B, exist to protect life. That they have a property protection function also is a happy coincidence. Single story buildings and fire are not considered to create a significant risk to fire and so are generally left unprotected. Section 7.4 of the approved document exclude from the definition of elements of structure that which only supports a roof. Exceptions may occur where an element of structure provides support or stability, such as in a separating wall or a compartment wall, or where there's an external wall which must retain stability. And it's the last of these, an external wall which must retain stability to prevent fire spread to adjacent, build to adjacent buildings, which is the most common situation where fire resistance is required in single story buildings. And this is called a boundary condition. This is a famous boundary condition. <clears throat> now, when you look at when single story buildings collapse in a fire, there's a danger that the collapsing roof structure will pull the perimeter stanchions down and allow the fire to get to any adjoining buildings. Where a boundary condition exists, the designer has the choice between fire protecting the whole building or using the Steel Construction Institute guidance, single story steel frame buildings and fire boundary conditions. And you can see that on the slide. This guidance outlines a method of designing the stanchion so that they will stay upright and support the affected wall when the rest of the building is allowed to collapse. The guidance includes details of how to deal with non-portal frames buildings with internal floors, buildings with internal compartmentation, and buildings supporting lean-to sheds. The key issue with single-story buildings and boundary conditions is to avoid fire protecting the whole building by ensuring that the walls on the affected boundary remain standing in fire. This can be done by designing the base of the stanchions to resist the overturning moment caused by collapse of the unprotected rafters. Typically, this may require that square bases become rectangular in shape and that a greater number of large holding down bolts are required, usually on the outer edge. The base plates may also be thicker and perhaps be stiffened. There are limitations on the size of buildings in which this method can be used. And where these limitations are exceeded, it's recommended, recommended that a fire engineered solution is sought. Where the buildings are fitted with sprinklers, advice is provided in the SCI publication as to whether or not it is necessary to, to design the stanchions to resist the overturning moment. If this um, methodology is applied correctly and there is a fire in a large building and only the stanchions along the protected boundary are protected, 
and the roof collapses in fire, it will work. And there's an example here. In this example, the walls have been cleared, but it can clearly be seen that despite very significant distortion on the roof, and therefore what would have been very, very significant overturning moments at the top of that, at the base of that stanchion, the stanchions remained upright and the bases did their job. The moment resistant bases did their job. I'm going to move on now to fire engineering. Um, we've already seen that one doesn't have to use approved document B to develop a fire strategy for a building. In fact, if you look there at the quote, the quote says, and this quote is taken from the approved document, it says that for certain buildings, a fire engineering approach may be the only way to ensure that the building may be safe and fire. Fire engineering is usually applied to the larger and more complex buildings, although it has wide applications also in finding solutions to particular problems in the design of fire precautions. I'm going to talk mainly today about structural fire engineering or fire engineering as it applies to structures. And the Institution of Structural Engineers has produced a document, some guidance on that. Um, this dates from 2007, so it's getting, getting a little bit dated now, but for anybody who is interested in this subject and wants to know a bit more, and wants to get a bit more information, this still remains an excellent introduction to the subject. Fire engineering in general depends very, very much on this issue of how severe is a real fire compared to how severe is a standard fire. If you look at this slide again, we've seen the red curve before, it's a standard fire. If, however, you get a real fire in a real building, the likelihood of getting anywhere close to the severity of a standard fire is pretty remote. And the reason for that is because in most buildings, what will happen is the fire will burn for a, a period of time where it can find the fire load. And then once the fire load has been consumed, it will move on. So you get this in any particular position in the building. Once you get a fire, you get this situation where you get fire growth, fire maturity, and then fire decay. And you get that then successively throughout the building as the fire moves throughout the building. And that's what you got, for example, in the Basingstoke building. And if you want to look at what happens in any particular part of a building, you're probably going to get something like, especially in an office, something like that green curve there. And this explains why the Basingstoke building was able to survive a four-hour fire with 90 minutes fire resistance. It did so because no part of that building was, was subjected to the full fire severity for four hours. It was only subjected to the full fire severity for a period of that four hours. And what that tells you is that periods of fire resistance are very often over-specified. And fire engineering approaches can make use of that. And a really good example um, were the sports stadia. Now, the great age of sports stadia design and construction has passed. But they are actually a very, very good example of where you can use this approach and where you can match fire precautions to the fire risk. Because if you looked at approved document B, most of the sports stadia, like this one here, this is St. James's Park in Newcastle, most of these would have required 90 minutes fire resistance. But fire engineers are able to go in there, look at the particular uh, circumstances in various parts of the building, look at what the fire load is likely to be, look at what the ventilation is likely to be, and there are methodologies which they can then use whereby they can calculate likely fire severity. So if you go into a structure like St. James's Park or any one of these buildings, what you will find is that they don't have 90 minutes fire resistance throughout the building. Some parts have 15 minutes, some parts have 30 minutes, some parts have 60 minutes, and some parts do indeed have 90 minutes. And another really good example of this is uh, was given to me recently by Jeremy Gardner Associates. And it, uh, it was a, some work they did at the Maxim Office Park outside Glasgow. Now, what you had here was 10 buildings, none of them particularly high. But in fact, they did all exceed a, um, a floor area requirement uh, in the technical handbook too. So they all required a... 120 minutes fire resistance. Now, when Jeremy Gardner Associates went in there and they looked at it, and they looked at, they carried out an analysis taking into account ventilation conditions, fire load, and the surface linings, etc. 
This showed that an actual fire would be as severe as exposure to the standard fire for 26 to 28 minutes. And the technical phrase that's used for there is what you would have said is the time equivalent is 26 to 28 minutes. So the time equivalent is 26 to 28 minutes. Now that would seem to indicate that you could put half an hour's fire resistance on those buildings and the buildings would be fine. But in fact, what they, they then did, or they looked at in more detail and they said, well, what would happen if things happened like let's suppose they had an excessive fire load in the buildings for example let's suppose the management system wasn't as good as it was supposed to be or if you had a fire all the windows didn't get knocked out only sufficient windows to provide the worst case ventilation conditions got knocked out what would happen then and when they looked at that they eventually they increased those figures of 26 to 28 minutes and they went back to the authorities and their proposal which was accepted was structural fire resistance of 60 minutes in nine buildings and 90 minutes in one buildings and that was accepted but i mentioned that i'm going to mainly talk about um structural fire engineering the previous slides demonstrated fire engineering is it is applied to obtaining reductions in fire ratings in buildings this has the effect of reducing the overall cost of fire precautions. But now, as I said, moving on to structural fire engineering. Modern structural fire engineering dates back to a series of fire tests carried out between 1994 and 2003 by the Building Research Establishment and the then British Steel on a composite steel deck building at Cardington in Bedfordshire. The genesis of these tests was a large-scale fire which took place at the Broadgate Phase 8 development in London in 1990. Broadgate is near Liverpool Street Station. The building was under construction and was only partially protected. The fire was severe and according to all that was known at that time about real structural behaviour in fire, which was based on the standard fire test and isolated elements of structure, that building should have collapsed. An investigation concluded that the reason it did not collapse was that the composite steel deck floor somehow developed considerable inherent strength in the fire, in the fire via a mechanism which was then not understood. This told us that these buildings behaved much better in fire than was apparent from standard fire tests. The question was how could the industry make use of this added strength and how and why did it occur? Incidentally, despite the apparent damage on this photo, structural repair on this building was less than 5% of the total uh, repair cost. The huge element, the huge cost element in this particular building was replacement of the cladding because the cladding was ruined by the smoke. But anyway, a couple of years later, what happened was the building research establishment constructed a building in Cardington near Bedford. Um, this building was a bog standard eight story composite metal deck building. I stress composite metal deck because everything I'm going to talk about now really applies to composite metal deck construction. For a number of years, the BRE and what was then Tata Steel, what was then British Steel, now Tata Steel, attempted to burn it down via a series of seven fire tests. These fire tests were hugely severe, very intense. Several of them attempted to replicate the standard fire test severity for 60 minutes. This was achieved, but it was not easy. And it demonstrated again the fact that real fires are unlikely in practice to be as severe as a standard fire test. Anybody who's interested in knowing more about this, all the data and several descriptive documents are available on www.steelconstruction.info. In the fire tests, the fire load was provided by gas or wood or in this, which was the most severe of all the fires, office furniture. In all the tests, the beams were unprotected and that can clearly be seen in this photograph. The purposes of the test, of the tests, was to demonstrate that composite steel deck floors had much greater levels of inherent fire resistance than was apparent from fire tests on individual members. And also to try and get enough information to generate an understanding of the mechanism by which that occurred so that it could be utilized in design. And I'm going to show you a short video here now of uh, a summary video of one of the fire tests. So that's the fire being uh, lit. And what we're going to try and do here is create a flashover condition. Flashover usually occurs when temperatures of the ceiling gets to about 600 degrees centigrade. And when flashover occurs, what happens is the intense radiation then sets fire, creates a spontaneous combustion throughout the compartment. You no longer need direct flame impingement. 
So it's starting to happen there, you're seeing all the smoke come out, and that is a flashover condition. And in there, the temperatures are getting to about 1200 degrees centigrade. And we got those temperatures up there for about 40, 45 minutes. That's the unprotected steel. As you can see, you're getting a fair bit of deflection, you're getting some distortion. These are just the protected sections, short sections are indicatives just to give us some temperature information. And this is a very, very severe fire indeed, with huge areas of unprotected steel. And that's the aftermath. And what you can see there is there's a lot of damage. There's a lot of distortion, but there is no collapse. There is no failure of the compartmentation. There is no failure of the building. This is the aftermath of the, fill, of the office fire test. The beams deflected significantly, about 1,100 millimeters at the maximum, and which then retracted about 700 millimeters on cooling. But the key thing is the floors remained intact. The beams got to about 1,100 degrees centigrade. And to put that in comparison, or to, put that, to compare that to what happens in a standard fire test, beams with the loading that these beams had in a standard fire test would have failed at about 700 degrees centigrade. So you had enormous inherent fire resistance in there. So the premise was proven. The test proved a number of things. First of all, the composite steel deck construction has significantly greater reserves of strength than is indicated by tests on individual members. So we, we demonstrated that conclusively. Columns are critical stabilizing elements. There was a theory at one stage that you could actually leave some columns unprotected and things as well. But in fact, we didn't run the fire protection right up to the top um, on some columns and things, and we got some small localized failure. So we concluded that columns will always be critical stabilizing elements. And most important, we proved that all the beams supporting composite steel deck floors do not need to be protected in order to prevent structural collapse in fire. The tests also enabled us to understand the mechanism by which the composite steel deck floors generated so much capacity than is apparent from small standard fire tests, so much more capacity than is apparent from small standard fire tests. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but analysis of the test results has shown that the load path mechanisms of a steel structure supporting a composite steel deck floor during a fire are different from those assumed during the normal use of the building. In particular, membrane action of the slab at large displacements enables it to enhance its load carrying capacity, and this enhanced capacity is what provides the additional capability of the floor. For those who are interested in pursuing this further, details can be found in a number of sources, but the one I would probably point you to is BRE Digest 462. That gives a fairly comprehensive um, and detailed uh, account of the fire test and the mechanism which enables those, those floors to survive. Now, there are, th this information, this understanding of the mechanism is used in advanced structural fire engineering now. Um, but I just want to draw your attention to one thing. The University of Sheffield have produced a program called Vulcan Light. Now, this has been developed, as I say, it's based on a sophisticated finite element analysis. It uses the full engine of a much larger program called Vulcan. And it provides comprehensive outputs, including deflections, time temperature curves, member forces, uh, information on slab cracking, and animated representations of deformation history. It is a proprietorial program for which a small fee is charged. But if you use this program, what you can do is you can look at individual slabs, so individual areas bounded by um, uh, columns at the corners. And you can use it to um, be able to design those slabs so that you can leave the secondary beams unprotected. And if you use it, you can end up with construction like that, unprotected secondary beams. Using it is, what it is, using it is fairly simple and straightforward and is, what it is within the capability of most structural engineers. It should be noted that some compensating features may be required. The most likely of these is that the mesh may have to be increased in size over that required for normal ambient design. This is because it has been discovered that the mesh is a critical element in developing the enhanced capacity of the slab and fire. But effectively, using something like Vulcan Light and coming up with answers like that um, and designs like that is within, within the capability of almost all structural engineers. However, that is relatively small scale. If you want to do large scale analysis, um, as it applies to whole floors and frames, um, 
you're really going to have to look for some specialist uh, abilities and spe specialist techniques. This ability, this knowledge is restricted to a relatively small number of specialist consultancies, but fortunately most of these are in the UK and it's an area in which the country, this country leads the world. I've taken as my example a project called Ropemaker Place and I'd like to acknowledge the support of Arab Far in, in uh, using this example. The details of the building, a large office in London, are shown. So in terms of London, this isn't a particularly special building, 21 storeys high, 84,000 square metres of, of floor area. The design of the, floor, of the floor is shown. It's a fairly standard steel frame with long span cellular beams, a composite steel deck and concrete core. So it's what, it has what has emerged over the years as a standard design for these tall buildings, composite metal deck frame with a, um, a uh, um, a concrete core and the UK beams at the perimeter, cellular beams internally. So the strategy in doing this, the strategy in carrying on this analysis was um, to uh, examine structural behavior in a realistic fire, develop a performance-based fire protection strategy, demonstrate that stability and compartmentation are maintained, look for any weaknesses where I, which might be exposed and look to modify the structural design uh, if required and more than anything the key thing is demonstrate a robust solution what Arab fire sought to do in this project was to demonstrate that the secondary beams could be left unprotected whilst relying on tensile membrane action the mechanism that enabled the cardian frame to survive this tensile membrane action would provide the strength to support the slab the aim was to protect those beams shown in red and leave the remainder unprotected. It's worth noting that the fire resistance period for the structural frame was 90 minutes. One would conclude, therefore, that Arab fire had also successfully obtained a reduction as approved document B would have called for 120 minutes fire protection. So the structural fire engineering approach um, fairly straightforward as you might imagine, calculate the real fire. So look at what happens in the real fire in there and look at its associated temperatures. Calculate the heat transfer from that fire to the structural elements and then calculate the mechanical response of the structure to this heat. So look at the deflections, the strains, force at the alternative load paths, etc. And when Arab fire did that, um, they came up with the solution that they wanted to come up with. It's usually not possible to remove this much fire protection from a structural frame without putting in some compensating features. In this case, there were two. Additional loose rebar was put in over the main span of the secondary beams supporting the 13.5 meter bays. This was necessary because the increased hogging moments, because of the increased hogging moments due to the high deflections of the slab in fire. Also, because the unprotected secondary beams will deflect considerably in fire, it was necessary to ensure that the connections had sufficient flexibility to absorb the additional moments as well. So the, 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 the connections uh, had a more ductile response. And if you'd gone into this building or a bit building like it afterwards, if you want to look at what, you, what these modern steel framed structural fire engineer buildings looked like, this is what they looked like. This is modern state-of-the-art structural fire protection in action. And that is as much as I want to say. I will finish at that point. Thank you for listening.